door there, she keeps referring to this mysterious door. Well, eventually it's enough to pique the curiosity of the firefighters. Six of them will break off inside, they'll go upstairs into the slave quarters and indeed find a strange door where none really should be. At the back of the slave quarters, it's locked shut, they'll use those pry bars and axes to break their way into it. And what they discover behind the door by lantern light is nothing less than a chamber of horrors. The Lollaries have built themselves a medical laboratory. Those slaves that have not worked out well have ended up the subjects of those medical experiments. They'll find the walls lined with jars full of human body parts preserved in alcohol, the most gruesome of which a large jar in what looks like to be some kind of large strip of gauze bandage. Closer inspection and looking through the very meticulous notebook by that jar will reveal that in fact it's a two-inch wide strip of human flesh some 15 feet long. Anatomical drawings, the Law Lares have taken one of the slaves that didn't work out and have slowly peeled that man's flesh from him like you would peel an orange in a spiral. The man is dead, the body is gone, but they've kept the remains of that particular experiment. They'll find three different bodies on examination tables, up there, steel examination tables. The first man, dead. He had had his healthy arm sawn off and a replacement arm had been sewn in place in an attempt to do some sort of strange transferal from the body of a dead man. It had been sewn in place, but of course it hadn't worked. They tried to shock the flesh back to life like something out of Frankenstein. The man had died from a gangrene infection. But of course they'd taken meticulous notes on that part of the experiment as well. Why waste? The other two bodies, though, are going to be the ones that throw those firefighters into a sickness. One man is said to faint away. Two men are said to come out onto the balcony and be seen throwing up over the sides of it. Because the last two are a male and female victim chained to the operating tables themselves. The Lollaries have apparently attempted to do a very crude sex change operation. They're dissecting their victims, trying to move organs from one to the other. They will find one living victim in there, however. Probably the most tragic. In a box, like you would keep some sort of livestock, like a goat or sheep, usually about three foot by three foot, they hear a knocking coming from inside, realizing there's something in there. They'll open that box up, only to find that there's a 14-year-old girl inside. She's only able to crawl out of that box on her elbows and shoulder blades. Her legs and her arms are at all wrong angles. The Lollaries have broken the bones in the arms and the legs, reset them at odd angles, waited for the bones to knit back together. That young girl will become known as the Crab Girl of Louisiana. As of the only living victim of the Lollaries, she probably would have been the person to testify against them in court if it had not been for the fact that the Lollaries had cut her vocal cords so she would never say anything at all. She'll only live for about a week after the firefighters rescue her. Now the firefighters have become sick. They've run out of the house. They're talking excitedly among themselves. And the guests that are still out in the street are wondering what's going on. They start eavesdropping on the firefighters, hearing these horrific stories. They will go inside to see for themselves if it is true. They are shocked when they see what the Lollaries have ever done. And these people who are very, very proud to be the friends, to be the associates of the Lollaries are going to turn against them. They are going to start calling for justice. They're going to call for the police to come to arrest these evil people, to take them away to stand trial. The Lollaries become so frightened by this angry mob that they will lock themselves inside of the house. The crowd doesn't have long to wait. Soon a carriage will come running down Royal Street, going at a fast speed. It's a big, dark carriage. When it gets up here, it is indeed the city police. They will arrive. The policemen get out of that carriage. They go to the front door. They demand to be let in. Moments later, the Lollaries, Louis and Delphine, are being marched out into that carriage. It's only those onlookers closest to the carriage that will realize that Delphine does not look at all upset that she's being taken away by the police. In fact, they say her arms are loaded down with baggage. People can see her jewelry boxes stuffed into the baggage. Well, they will get into that police carriage. The police carriage goes around the corner, disappears into the night. The people are cheering. They think that they finally are going to see some justice. Well, it's not. Delphine has somehow managed to get a message out her family, friends on the police force. This isn't the arrest vehicle, this is the getaway vehicle, and in fact, the Lollaries will never be seen in New Orleans again. Where did they go? No one actually does know the answer to that. People will say that they took that money for the, the sale of the jewelry, said to be about a half million dollars worth of jewelry in those days, and headed for France, back to Louis' old home country. Other people said, no, actually, they went no further than the North Shore of Lake Pontchartrain. They would take up residence plantation house there, changed their names, protected by Delphine's extensive, politically connected family, live out the rest of their lives just a few dozen miles from where they had committed those crimes. The remaining slaves, they would tell tales themselves in court. Nothing would ever come of it. They were sent on to other owners, some of them given their freedoms in the worst abuse cases. But no one would ever 
ever come back to this house. The police eventually did come to investigate the proper police, not the friends of the Lollaries. They would end up locking this house up. And strangely enough, this would become the site of the very first ghost tour in New Orleans. Yes, the first tour didn't start in the 1980s. It started in the 1830s. You may see, if you go around to souvenir shops around the French Quarter, a little recreation of those very first cards people were handing out for the rather large sum of money of 50 cents in those days. Tour guides would bring you down to the old murder house, the Wallery Mansion on Royal Street, begin telling you those stories. People would say that on those early tours, as they talked about the crimes of the Lollaries, you could still hear the voices of the victims inside the house. You could hear moans, you could hear chains rattling, you could hear voices of people pounding on the walls of the house. It made the house get a terrible reputation. No one would buy the half-burned house at that point. It would end up standing empty for years. The reputation of the house for unluck became so strong that people would stop going under the galleries beneath that people would cross the street, cross themselves, to ward off bad luck. Over the years, people would say that you could see the ghosts of the Lollaries in the house. When this building did become a tenement building towards the end of the 1800s, mostly a home for those Italian immigrants who were arriving in our city, it was said that they were still haunted, not only by the ghost of that man whose arm had been cut off spectacularly, he was said to be stumping up and down the hallways, looking very sad as if he wanted something that he could not possibly get from those people, but actually from the ghost of Madame Delphine herself. People in the house would say that the white lady could be seen haunting the house, that she would take special attention to your children, that you had to stay up at night to watch your children because of the white lady. No one ever really associated it with Delphine until years later. One couple said that they even came in one night to see that down the hallway where their infant had been crying all night, there was a woman, a white woman, bending over the cradle that the baby's crying had suddenly stopped. When the father went in to see what had happened, they discovered that that child's booty had been removed from its foot and stuffed all the way back into the back of its throat, the child turning purple managed to save the kid, but it was enough to convince the people that it had to be abandoned. And indeed, the house was set abandoned again until 1907. In 1907, it had been on the block for nearly 15 years. Finally, a man would buy this house at auction. He was a furniture importer. Felt that this great old structure that he'd gotten on the cheap would be wonderful for a store and a residence for his family. He would begin removing the interior walls on this first floor to put in a showroom. Now in this abandoned building, of course, not only were the walls in terrible shape, but so were the floors. He was going to pull them up, put new wooden floors in. It was when he began pulling up those floorboards that part of the mystery of the Lollaries was also discovered. You see on the backs of some of those wood panels that made up the floor, long scratches, first thought to be those of animals, discovered to be those of humans when a human fingernail was discovered in one of those claw marks. Looking beneath that floorboard, staples like blacksmiths would make were pounded in, chains attached to them. Pulling back on the chains, people discovered 12 more bodies, more victims of the Lollaries. People believed that they were actually victims the Lollaries had not finished their experiments on, that they may have actually been tucked away beneath the floors for the night of the party, that in fact the voices that people heard that they mistook for ghosts of the victims were in fact still living victims desperately trying to get the attention of those curious passers-by on the street to rescue them, that they'd slowly died dehydration being eaten alive by the rats and the palmetto bugs of the French Quarter. The luck of the house has not changed. Different owners have had it over the years. Most famously, this house was owned by Nicolas Cage. Oh. When he was at the height of his career, the money was pouring in. <coughs> Nicolas Cage bought properties in different cities that he enjoyed spending time in, one of which the haunted Lollary Mansion. It was on the market those days. Nobody was buying it. He thought this was a great thing. He only ended up staying in the house for some three weeks. He never actually would come back after he had moved in, and actually it had parties around inviting locals to come into it. Why, he never said, but at about six and a half years, and that's right about a half year as long, or excuse me, a half year from the longest anyone has owned it, and interestingly enough, seven years was when the Lollaries' crimes were discovered. That's how long they had lived in the house. He would have a state of bad luck also, his being a run-in apparently with the IRS. They were not kind to him, slapped him with a whole, whole big number of fines. He ended up selling off the Lollary Mansion to pay off those fines. Tragically, he no longer lives in the house. It would have been nice to come by and say, hey, Mr. Cage, while we're on the tour. Now, did anyone have any questions? Uh, the house has been purchased within the last year by some kind of shell company. We don't know <coughs> who the actual owner is. We think that it's part of a corporate purchase. Um, we think it's been turned into corporate apartments. Uh, some kind of large corporation allows their, uh, especially their C team, to stay here when they're in town. It's been very quiet who that is. Rumor mill says it's BP. 
Hmm. Which could explain why it's so very, very quiet. <laughs> 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 um, 